Today we had Leslie Awasom. He is out of Baltimore and he is a CRNA turned real estate syndicator slash clinic operator, uh, infusion clinic, recently started an infusion clinic. He's talking about uh, just building a portfolio and the power of using a team and leveraging. Uh, it was like s- notoriety. They did some cool stuff with the way they formed their company and they brought in uh, their, their two partners and they were able to bring in a third partner that kind of got them to the next level. And by giving up some of the company and taking a step back, they were able to propel themselves forward. So it's a good lesson on. Which I can relate to because Jennifer did the same thing. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> let me have some of this business. Step aside. Let me have it. Uh, All right, so welcome to the Investing RN podcast. Today we have a, a guest, Leslie Awasom. I think I said that right. You got it, brother. You got it right. From Cameroon, born in Cameroon, moved to the States when he was 18. Um, tried different things, chose nursing, then anesthesia, and and now is trying some new things again. We'll get all into it, uh, buying a bunch of real estate, uh, opened a new business recently. We're going to talk all about it, and he's going to give you advice and tell you what not to do and, and what to do. <laughs> So welcome, Leslie. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah. So let's let's start out by we usually kind of ask how people even, I guess, hear about nursing. Like why why nursing as opposed to anything else? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh for for me, it was like um the the moment I, I stepped my foot in the US, that's what my mom started preaching in my ears. Like you gotta go into the medical field. She actually wanted one of us to be a doctor. Uh, because my mom is a nurse, uh, she migrated to the U.S. as a nurse, so that provided her a ton of opportunities in healthcare. She saw the immigrants doing very well in healthcare, so um, coming to the U.S., uh, so she wanted her kids to, to do well, so that's why she was trying to push on us. She tried pushing it on my sister, and she was like, nah, 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 I'm not doing that. I don't care what you say, so um, so she uh, pushed it on, on my siblings and I, and um Initially, I wasn't doing. I wasn't gonna do nursing. I came in. I was studying computer science. I was back in two thousand, and um, um, with the computer science, I think right around there, that's when the bubble, the dot com bubble, um, burst, and a lot of computer science uh, uh, professionals lost their job. Everybody in my community that I was looking up to, that was studying computer science, all of them lost their job. So. Um, so at that point, my mom won, you know, cause she was like, I told you, you know, you gotta get something that is a stable, stable job and all of that. So I was like, okay, okay. I guess uh, the mom is always right. So I went into nursing. <laughs> That's all they ever want to hear is that they are right. Yeah. right? <laughs> this episode is sponsored by all day investments. If you would like to get your start in real estate investing, but don't want to deal with toilets or tenants, we have several new opportunities that might interest you head over to all day investments.co forward slash invest or follow the link in our show notes to book a call with our team so you tried uh computer science then nursing your mom was a nurse what what does that look like um, going from as a nurse in cameroon to the u.s is it an easy transition or what does that even look like uh no it's it, it wasn't um she actually went for graduate studies in in canada um completed her graduate studies then applied and i got a job here in the u.s um, but it wasn't easy. Um, you have to come in, have to you know, sit for the NCLEX. Uh, I think it's much easier now than it was before. You had to get all your licenses and all of that done, then sit for the NCLEX, then um, um, before you start getting a job. So a lot of nurses that migrate come in, start off as CR, uh, CNAs or assistants and why they work through the system. I was gonna say that seems to be pretty common with like all the medical professionals that are coming to the States. And it it seems like there should be a smoother transition. It sounds like they're working on it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, if your medicine's medicine, it's, it, sh- it should, it should translate. I think there is like for nurses, like the, like the Filipino nurses that get recruited from the Philippines to come to the U S. So all of that process gets taken care of way in advance before they get here. So, um, uh, for others that migrate on their own, then you have to go to the, the system, yeah. which is what it is. Yeah. So, did yeah. she, uh, what, what, uh, field was your, or department was your mom in? So, um, in Cameroon, when she migrated as a nurse, you do everything. It's not like really specialized. My, my mom has done midwifery. She's done like uh med surge ICU back in Cameroon. 
But when she came over here, I think she was working in like a, a med surge unit. Um, yeah, that's where she's worked for the most part and step down unit. And then for you, did you, did you get into something like that or did you go straight for ICU knowing you want to do this, uh, the CRNA route? So I didn't know I wanted to do the CRNA route, but I went straight for ICU. Um, when I got into nursing, um, the more I learned about nursing, I realized, oh my God, it is a really broad field. It, it truly is a great foundational career to start or however direction you want to go. And, um, the fact that it had that great foundation, um, the demand is quite high and then you could branch off in whatever space you want to go, whether it's like to be like an executive or nurse practitioner or what informatics, there were so many other things that you were looking at at that point in time. And, um, when I was, I just knew that, okay, this is a good foundation. I'm going to live from here and then I'm going to keep growing and figure something else out. Um, at the time. I didn't even know about the uh, CRNA career, to be honest with you. I didn't even know anything like that existed when I started nursing school. It wasn't until like uh, my second year into nursing school that I came across a CRNA and um, it just blew my mind. I went and did some research and I was like, oh my God, you know, this is possible. And, um, and, 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 and the reason why I chose initially to go to the ICU is because everybody told me that's the most difficult unit to go into. So that's one um, trait that I, I've always had. I always try to push myself to go after the challenging stuff. So I was like, I got to figure out a way to get into the ICU. One of my friends had graduated. He was working at a uh, Hopkins ICU and he was like, don't worry, I'll put a referral in and you get in. So I was able to get in that ICU. Then um, later on down the line, I was like, okay, let me do the CRNA thing. Uh, that seems like a good direction to go at that time. Yeah, it's kind of a, a it's a blessing and a curse like in the nursing field because yeah. there's so many things that you can do yes so i mean i like options but i don't like i don't want 50 options give me like three or four and then i can pick yeah <laughs> um so w at what point did you find out what a crna is and what, what and what we do so it was like um second year nursing school um i met a crna um in greensboro north carolina um i was doing a a, a rotation in the pack here and i met a crna and she was telling me what they do they give anesthesia and everybody was telling me how good of a career it is you know so i went back and did some research i was like oh my god this is really an interesting field um but then i was hearing all the stories about how difficult how challenging it is and all of that so um, I, that seed got planted in my head, but I had not made up my mind at that point that this is the path I want to go. I was like, man, this has so many options. Actually, one of the things that I was considering was like doing some kind of international war health kind of stuff. Um, because I'm, I'm from Cameroon. So I always had that passion of being able to help people from, um, back home. So maybe like working for the WHO or one of these, um, international organizations, that's actually one of the things that was piquing my interest while I was in nursing school, not CRNA. That's uh, I, I think that's interesting because we've talked to travel nurses that are traveling domestically in the United States, but um, and 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 what you're talking about is kind of different. But like I've heard about travel contracts in Dubai and international travel contracts, and I, I don't know what working for the WHO like is like pay wise, but I know some of these Dubai contracts are like crazy money and they'll pay you and they'll pay all your living and all that kind of stuff. Um, what, what does like work and did you look into it in terms of like pay rates and like how, how that all kind of works and what kind of licenses you need? Yeah, actually, um, the friend I told you about my very good friend that, uh, uh, got me into Hopkins. Uh, he actually got a job at the WHO and he actually works over there. He's like, um, a uh, big shot there in, in Africa in Congo working for WHO. So, so, but he had to do like a master's in, um, I think it's healthcare administration, mm -hmm. um, to be able to get that job. So he doesn't really work as a nurse over there, but more on the administrative side. I, I do believe the pace in the six figures and, um, it, it, it's, it's a great job for people that love to travel that have really have a passion for that kind of work. So, um, he, he's doing it. He loves it. And to be honest, I, it seemed good to me at that time, but I would not have loved it as much as I love what I'm doing right now. Yeah. The, the CRNA route is definitely powerful. My, my buddy's an ER doctor and he said if, if he had known about CRNA when he was in college, he's like, I would have done nursing school. I would have done CRNA school and I would have skipped all this, <laughs> this med school yeah. and re residency and all that nonsense. But do how, how far into your CRNA career was it when you started dabbling in real estate? Uh, it didn't take me long to be honest. Um, 
Um, so I graduated from CRNA school in 2000, in December of 2014, started working in uh, March of 2015. As I got in, I was very hungry. You know, the student loan debt, I haven't been working for years. My wife, we've been living on crumbs. So I was, I was, I was, I was hungry to work. So I was working. Um, I was doing like 60 hours a week, 60, 70 hours a week. And I loved it. I'm like, man. Compared to nursing, this is a walk in the park. And I, I love that that OR environment and all of that. So, but after then my second daughter was born in 2015. And I was spending all of my time in the hospital, coming in, barely spending any time with my daughter at home. Like uh, at about, I think it was like 2016, I started asking myself, like, oh my God, is this what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life? Um, but it's really in the winter months. I leave my house when it's dark. I come back when it's dark, right? And by the time I get back home, I'm so tired. I can't do anything else. So I was like, is this how my life is going to be forever? Then I started looking at other CRNAs that have been in the career for like um, 40, 50 years. You know, these guys are doing very well financially. They have nice houses, but there was just something about them that just did not, I did not see myself, um, doing that for a long time and being happy doing that. So I started researching and starting to figure out what else I could do as a CRNA, as a side hustle. Um, I came across a book uh, um, by Robert Kiyosaki called Second Chance at Your Money and Your Life. Um, so I bought that book. I read the book. At that time, I had over $200,000 in, uh, in, $200, in student loan debt. The book was like, this is a great book for uh, millennials in student loan debt and trying to figure out the U.S. The financial system. The book broke everything down to me. I had a lot of questions coming out of the 2008 recession where I had some family members that lost homes and saw all this crazy stuff happening. I didn't understand what was going on. That book answered all those questions for me. And it also gave me a path, a way out. It said, okay, in this stage, what you want to be looking at is investing in yourself. Uh, real estate is a good route to look at. Invest in personal development. It talked about some authors that, um, that he has listened to. So I just followed that path. I bought the, all, some of the, uh, the tapes from the authors he mentioned, the books. And then I started going out to real estate events and said, let me learn about this real estate stuff and see uh, where it goes. Um, so that was around 2016 when, when I started uh, walking down that path. So how long did you educate yourself before you, before you dove in? Because I know analysis paralysis, that's like something that's preached Huge. It's, it's a big uh, talking point. So what did you do before you bought your first property? And then if you don't mind diving into your first property and the numbers and all that. Absolutely. Uh, it took too long because I, I was just going crazy on this educational journey, reading these books, you know, listening to all this tape. Then I was trying so hard to get everybody around me because I didn't have the confidence myself to do it. So I was trying so hard to get all of my friends to board in, like maybe somebody's going to take the lead and I follow but nobody was really as interested as I was. I told you about the second chance book. I bought about 10 copies of that and I sent it out to my friends, uh, but it looks like none of them read it or even if they read it, they did not get it as I got it. So um, I was reading this book, going to the RIAs, I signed analysis process, like you say, it is very common, especially for us healthcare provi providers, especially anesthesia providers. Uh, because if you think about it, um, our training as anesthesia providers is to learn everything that might go wrong during surgery so nothing goes wrong, right? So when you get out of the world in business, that is the same approach which we tend to take, and that's what I was taking. So after about a year of reading books, going to all these uh, networking events, I was talking to any and everybody around me about it, including my younger brother. And uh, one day he was like, man, you're talking a lot about this real estate stuff. Let's do it. Right. I was like, okay, let's do it. So um, we put money together. Easy for him to do because he lives in California. He came to Maryland and we looked at the property. He's like, okay, man, you got this. He, so <laughs> we bought the property. <laughs> so we bought this property. It was, uh, we bought that property for $92,000. It was an estate sale, a condo. Um, the person that lived in there had just passed away. So the family sold it to us. It was a little beat up, but a really nice area by high school. So we ended up spending about $14,000 to repair something that probably would have cost $6,000 in, 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 in hindsight. Um, but during that process, I took two weeks off of work and I was um, 
supervising the contractors, like doing all the breakdowns and making all the plans and going through all of this. And I loved it. Like I would leave the house at 6 a.m., go there. And there's nobody there. I was just there by myself, start cleaning up stuff. The workers would come in, would do the work. And I spent my whole day there for like two weeks. And I really enjoyed doing it. Right. And I was like, oh my God, this really, this stuff might be something that I do. Um, I'm going to buy more houses and do this. Um, so we were doing the BRR model, which is like buy, uh, renovate, um, rent, refinance, and repeat. So um, when we got to the refinance state, we realized that the that house, had, the homes in that area had increased. The value of that property had increased by like $77,000. I was like, oh my God, this works. In less than six to seven months, we've generated this much money from an investment. What Robert Kiyosaki was saying is not a scam, it's real, right? So that got me really excited. I was like, we got to do more of this. You know, I got. I was thinking about just going and buying, like buying like two properties, two, three properties a year and taking it from there. But then uh, things change along the way. <laughs> that sounds similar to ours, but even better because like I think we made, we made about, we our first deal we did was a burr and it was in Wisconsin. Uh -huh. It was like 35000 to buy the house, 20000 rehab. It appraised for 80. We got 60 back, made 5,000. Oh my God. Yeah. Ended up having to put a little more into like bats and AC, but still came out on top. <laughs> but it didn't matter because yeah. we saw that it yeah. worked. And, yeah. and we were so excited. We're like, oh, this is it. We're going to do this. We go out, found the next house, bought it for like 23 grand, and it turned into a two year flip, and we barely broke even. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> How'd it go for you after the first one? So the, the first round could have gotten, could have gotten like your second one, but we got lucky because the uh, values increased in that area, right? Because like I said, our rehab costs end up being double uh, what it was supposed to be. So we got lucky because of the economy and all of that. So after that, right, um, I was thinking of going and buying more units, single family units and doing the same thing and doing because I've always wanted to be rental, long-term rental. Flips, the other shorter term stop was not really um, holding my interest. I was looking to create more wealth. So around that time, I met my uh, my first partner, uh, my first initial partner for Excel Capital, Tenny. He owned a financial services company and he was coming to sell me life insurance. I had gone through like a ton of all, you know how when you get out of school, they want to sell you all this insurance stuff and stuff like that. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I almost signed up for like some crazy stuff. Then I figured it out and I was very skeptical of any financial advisors or anybody that sell life insurance. But when this guy came, we had a conversation, we talked, I prepared him with a bunch of questions because I had been doing a lot of reading and he was very honest and very knowledgeable in what he was saying. So I was like, oh, this is an interesting guy. So I was like, I'm not going to buy insurance with you yet, but you seem like a nice guy. We were reading the same book at that time. So we became friends and we used to meet and play a board game by Robert Kiyosaki called Cash Flow and just talk business. He's talking about his financial services. I'm talking about real estate. So at one point he was like, I've always wanted to be in real estate. Why don't we partner up and then scale whatever you're doing? Um, so we did. Um, we did. We said we're going to partner up and go buy more properties and maybe do the BRR model and stuff like that and hold it long term. But when we were doing our research, uh, we started reading books on real estate and investing. We came across a tiny little book on multifamily investing by Grant Cardone. We read that book. The way he simplified the process to, to, to us was like a light bulb moment. Understanding the power of being able to buy multiple units at once. And then the math on how these properties are valued. We were like, oh my God, this exists and we don't know about it. It's kind of like the same um, realization that I came across when I found out that something as a CRNA exists, right? Like, like there's in, this, this stuff is out there, but I don't know about it. Who else around me doesn't know about it? Went back to work, asked all the CRNA colleagues, doctors, if they heard about investing in multifamily assets through syndications. They're like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't know what that is. You sure it's not a scam? You did blah, blah, blah. So I was like, yeah, there's, there's definitely a need here to create something and go and uh, educate members of that community. So I left from that single investment to founding Excite Capital with Tenny initially, and then um, Dr. Oni, um, and Dr. Oni became our third partner later on down the line. So I'm on, I'm on your website right yeah. now. Um, 
and I see that you guys have uh, a total portfolio of almost almost 200 million. I guess 168 is what it says on your website. Yes. 838 doors under management. Yes. So, so how do you go from one burr to starting to diving into something this this huge, this large, this valuable, I guess, like cause the analysis paralysis is, is big on a small scale, but when you dive into these massive properties, I, I can only imagine what it's like at that point. So how did you overcome that? And, and what are the beginnings of XI capital look like? Uh, people, man, I'm going to credit that to people, the people that I met along the way and, um, and personal development. Um, so very early on when I was, uh, on my journey of like, uh, self-education and personal development. I was reading all these books by myself. I came across, uh, I went to one uh, hospital while I was working for a DM and I was reading a book and Sierra and walked up to me. He's like, hey man, you read books too? I'm like, yeah. He's like, what are you reading? I'm like, I'm reading this. He's like, oh man, I thought I was the only one who read it. I don't talk about this stuff. Um, he's like, I've been into personal development since I was like 16 or whatever. His name is Chris Scott. I credit him a lot. He doesn't really know what he did for me, but he, he contributed a significant amount to my growth. Um, so Chris, uh, said, Hey, you should check out this book. Go read Think and Grow Rich. Go read this. And he was sending me like other books on personal development or mindset, um, that at that point that I started diving into because, uh, skills is one thing. Psychology is probably the biggest thing ever. Uh, like you talk about analysis, paralysis and all of that. A lot of that is based on the psychology base, um, psychology basis, right? Like Tony Robbins said, it's like 80% psychology, 20% skill. And there's no doubt about that. So I had to work a lot on my own personal psychology in order to be able to do that. And I credit to a lot for like uh, my partner, uh, Tony Tolofari and uh, Dr. Julius Oni uh, for helping me along the way because I had a lot of fears. So many fears you cannot even imagine. Like our very first, uh, for example, like our very first meetup that we had, you could have seen me over there. I was jittering like I was uh, I was uh, a crackhead or something. Just nervous, <laughs> right? Just nervous to talk to people. Just nervous to talk about this. So um, partners, like the people that we met along the way and just pushing through those fears, like going against your comfort zone, pushing against your comfort zone. And then you start realizing, oh, my God, it's not as crazy as I thought, right? This is something of need that you're actually providing and you, 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 I can do this. I am doing this. So you just go every day, take action, quiet the fears, take action, and then keep going. So that's how I went from the single family, uh, uh, uh rental to starting XI Capital with my partners. I'm so blessed. Tenny is kind of opposite. He doesn't have any fears. If you say, let's go talk to Barack Obama tomorrow or Donald Trump to invest, he's going to be like, oh, what's his number? Let me call him. So, <laughs> so while I like to spend time thinking, he's like, no, let's do it and do it. So that balance kind of helped me realize that a lot of the things I fear is more in my head than in reality. So, and then the more I kept doing, the more I kept growing. So what are, so there's three partners in XI Capital yes. now, right? So what is each of your roles and how did that, transition from when you first started to what it looks like today it's, it's been an interesting transition uh <laughs> I, I am a director of operations i'm more on the operations side i manage our manage operations of xi capital and our assets that we have uh Teddy is director of acquisitions he's on the forefront with brokers in the markets talking to and trying to get us these deals uh dr only as ceo is also director of investor relations like he brings in the relationships and um, the investors, uh, he leads that front for like, um, sourcing investors that, that invest in these deals. When we started out, I was actually director of acquisitions and I was, I was, I was bad at it. And Tenny was director of operations. <laughs> the main reason we did it that way is because I was, um, I did the underwriting when we started because I love playing with numbers and all of that. So I did, I was doing the underwriting. So we thought underwriting person has to be acquisition. So, but. I was so scared to even talk to brokers that wasn't working. Um, um, so that was not working. Tony and I initially started Excite Capital. So it was just two of us, right? So I went to the hospital and I went to pitch Dr. Oni to become an investor, a passive investor in Excite Capital. When he finally got the chance to review the deal package that we provided to him, he called, he was like, I don't want to be an investor. I want to be a partner. We were like, oh my God. 
this is amazing, right? Because when we started and I was thinking in my head, like, who are some of the people that this can be great for? He was the first person that came to mind. And Teddy and I actually practiced on how to pitch him, how to talk to him to be an investor. And when he saw it and he was like, oh, no, this is powerful stuff. I want to be a partner. It was a no brainer for us. So when he came on board, it was like the third leg of the tripod that just came in and stabilized everything. And that is truly when our growth trajectory started, right? In the beginning, we were just running around doing a, doing a lot of work, but not seeing a lot of growth. When he came on board and we have right, all the pieces in the right places, then we just took off from there. That's, that's, that's cool to hear because it's like, I think um, between, that's kind of something we're going through right now. And it's like getting out of that mindset of, um, like not wanting to give some of the company away. Like it's, it's like you have that fear of like, well, I don't want to give equity away or whatever, but it's like, like you were saying, like he's the third leg now and, and you've been able to grow probably beyond what you could have done had you stayed as the two of us. And, and it's like, I mean, it sounds like you'd already had that in your mind, but it's like, how do you kind of like justify that? Or is, is it like a, an equation you run or is it just like something you feel like, how, how did you guys figure out that that's what you needed to do? Our philosophy has always been, it's better to own 1% of a billion dollar company than to own 100% of a zero dollar company. That has always been our philosophy, right? And that is what we maintain going forward. So um, we, were, we were never shy. We will never shy away from talking to partners that will help us grow or partnering with people that will help us grow. And we have the philosophy that we have, which is actually one of our core values, is the growth and abundance mindset. We do believe there's truly more than enough for everybody, right? If you bring a significant amount of value that's going to help us grow, if you share in our, um, in our own values as, as individuals, if you bring skills that are bad, that is going to take us to the right direction. We have all, we had always been open, like to, 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 to bring in a partner. And when he came, it was a no brainer for us. Like that call, when Dr. Ernie called that day, I can never forget that day when he called. I, I said, hold on a second. He's like, is your partner available? I'm like, yes. He said, I want to talk to you both. I'm like, hold on a second. I switched over the call and I called Tenny. I was like, you remember the doctor I told you about? He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on the phone. Let's get on a call and talk. That call normally probably would have lasted 15, 10 minutes, but it ended up lasting four hours. Like we were just going back and forth on like our visions of life, the way we look at things where we are and it was just like it was it felt natural it felt right right so it was a no-brainer for us that all three of us are going to be equal partners we can keep going two of us and end up with nothing we had just come off of trying to raise on a deal where we could not even raise a thousand dollars Tenny and i <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we could keep going and doing that and thinking oh we have this company and all of that or we could bring we could work with somebody that brings in a significant amount of value that none of us can bring, and then we grow together. So it was a no-brainer for us, and uh, we are all we were uh, all equal partners, and um, and really all two of them are like brothers in growth, and I'm um, I'm truly like incredibly blessed uh, to have them in my life and um, to be going on this journey with them. So so the three partners that you have now, so you're a CRNA, uh, your your other partner is a financial. Advisor, no, he's a he cybersecurity engineer, but his initial side also was like a financial services business. Okay. And then what was your third part? He's an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Oni. Okay. Are all three of you um, phasing out or do you plan, do any of you plan to keep doing what you're doing? Previously, we all phasing out. All we all phasing out. We had a conversation about it yesterday and we're like, it's time. I do want to talk about that because before we hit record, um, we were talking about going through all this and like um, amount of school and then just, and then just like not throwing it away, but like, essentially you're kind of throwing away everything that you've learned. How are you, how are you able to do that? I guess for somebody who's put a ton of time into school and the amount of student loans you paid back because of this school, and now you're, you're transitioning into another phase of life. So it depends, right? Um, and again, I, I'll go back to, I love quotes. I'll go back to a quote that, uh, Tony Robbins says, which is like the strongest force in human psychology is the need to stay true to who we identify ourselves to be, right? So it depends, right? If your identity is strong as a CRNA or a doctor, that's all you've ever wanted to be in your life. 
it's going to be difficult for you to move that away, right? And, and, and go to something else. But if you have an identity of something bigger, of something more, then being a CRNA might just be a path to wherever you're going, right? So for me, um, it's not hard at all, right? I love the CRNA job that I do, um, but I've always thought that I could give way more value to the world than staying at a job. Like, And I love like getting into entrepreneurship. I truly found my passion, being able to build these businesses from scratch, going through that pain. It's a painful process. It's not like a pie in the sky or fun like everybody tries to make it be. It's not for everybody. It's painful. So, But I enjoy doing it, right? And I've always seen myself as that. Prior to going to CRN school, I tried multiple other businesses, and I failed at them, but I never stopped. So for me, it's not hard. And for my partners, it's not hard as well because we see the value that we could give um, by going on this path, uh, being able to do what we do. Um, so uh, it's just a transition. It's a transitional phase of life. I'm, my degree doesn't get taken away from me. The years that I spend grinding, going to rough clinicals to have my CRNA degree, in, it's never going to get taken away from me, right? That's a journey I went through. But if I see something else that I enjoy doing that I have a passion for, I should not be stuck over here just because I spend money on it. No, the growth has to continue. Yeah. So this sounds like it's been kind of a gradual stepping away because before you said you've been you've been a CRNA nine yes. years um, and you've been kind of slowly phasing out. Yes. Did Have you been phasing out equally with how you've been replacing your, your salary or is it just? Um, no, it never is. It's, it's not it's, for, for me personally, it's not a smooth process, right? Maybe for some people it's like smooth. You do all of this and do all of that. So, for example, um, so this is what led to my phase out. Let me be uh, uh, very honest. Um, in 2023, um, I, no, in 2021, right, I stopped working as a full-time and I went to per diem CRNA, right? And at that point, I was doing mostly like weekends and nights and during the week, I'm working on my business. Our business is growing 2021, 2022. We're acquiring more assets, right? So the goal was that at the end of 2023, uh, 20, I'm going to phase out completely. So thankfully, luckily for me, as I was working per diem, that's when the CRNA rates went like bonkers. Like my uh, <laughs> rate pretty much doubled, right? So I was working less and making way more, right? And then uh, 2023 came along. I set the goal in 2023 that I was going to exit full-time W. I'm going to exit the hospital completely at the end of 2023. The infusion clinic I mentioned to you guys before the call, um, we were supposed to launch in March of 2023. We experienced all kinds of delays and all kinds of delays, expenses, and every, everything when did not go as planned, right? 2023 was also a very slow year for us on the syndication side. We did not acquire any deals, right? So we made no, we didn't make any. We made income from the deals that we own, but we didn't make any income from um, some of the deals that we acquired because part of our income comes from the acquisition of these deals. So 2023 was uh, when it comes to like income from business was like a very slow year. But now at the hospital. Um, I'm per diem. I'm limited in the number of hours that I could pick, right? Which worked well for me. But the hospital had been begging me and saying, hey, we need staff. You are short staff. Please pick up extra, do this. And I kept doing that, right? So um, mm -hmm. in um, November of this year, the administrator called me and I was like, hey, Leslie, you've exceeded the number of hours that you could work in a year. And uh, main administrators are like, you got to cut you. We got to take you off the schedule so you cannot work. So the end was actually forced, right? Because at that point, if, if everything was going smooth, I probably would have kept picking up a couple of shifts over there. But at that point, I had to ask myself the question, what do I really want to do, right? Um, yeah, and I spoke to my wife, and my wife, for the first time, um, to our my entrepreneurial journey, she was like, nah, you're not going back. Just focus on business. I was like, oh, my God, what's happening here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I got the support of my spouse and um, I, we had, then our clinic launched in November. Um, so I had the time now to focus on the business, on the businesses, because my hospital said I cannot pick up any shifts until March. So I said, I'm going to use that time to focus on my business and then see if at the end of March, 
things are not working, maybe I'll go back to the hospital. But oh boy, oh boy, that has been the greatest, one of the all greatest blessings of my life that that happened. One of my goals in life has always been to be able to wake up every morning and drive my kids to school. I get to do that now. I come back home. We have conversations. I help them with homework. I, I see them grow. It is so much beauty. Then the time that I, I have, using that time to focus in on our business, on, our, on, our, on my businesses, has been exponential. Like the return on investment, that the, because your greatest, the greatest asset is your time. And you really do not know how valuable your time is until you have that time to yourself. You might think your, your, the value of your time is the, is the hourly rate that you get. But if you have a platform or something that you could apply that time to, you could create a sick, way more value than you could ever think. So thankfully for me, this happened at a stage where I had built multiple platforms that I could focus in on. So that's what I'm doing, and I'm like, I'm just going to go complete my shifts in March, and I am done and focusing on business moving forward. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that, that's powerful stuff, yeah. You, you never know how valuable your time is until, until you have it, yes. I guess. I don't, and then that's kind of like a, a mindset that everybody, I, I guess I can't say everybody, but most people fall into, like, this is how much I get paid for my time, so this is how valuable yes. I am. Uh, but to your point, you, you're way more valuable if you just put, put your time in the right spot. Well, yeah. And, and earlier you mentioned uh, the word wealth. So I, I would be curious to know, like, what is your definition of wealth? Uh, my, my definition of wealth is it truly is freedom and um, being able to do the things that I love to do and when I want to do it, however way I want to do it. That's, that's true wealth for me. And um, I'm being able to, to, to impact others. Like that is, uh, that is being able to impact others. That's something that I'm really passionate about being able to, uh, to, to, to show others that there's more possibility to them, uh, that they have more possibilities for themselves in the beautiful world that we live in than what they're being exposed to. So being able to have that impact, whatever it's, it's, uh, like for me, it, it truly is, isn't about the money. The money gets me the freedom to do whatever I want to do. Uh, but it is that whatever I want to do. That is the true wealth for me and being able to do that and have an impact on others. Yeah. You said it perfectly. Like whenever we ask anybody this question, actually, I think that's the first time we've asked that question on this podcast, but I've heard other people ask it and money is never mentioned when people talk about what true wealth is. I've never heard dollars or yeah. money ever part of that conversation. Yeah. It's always the freedom that, that it brings. Absolutely. It's, it's the little things like you mentioned, like taking your kids to school. Like I, I've been in a, out of nursing for a couple of years and, I, I'm back and forth about going back to doing a travel assignment. But when I left nursing, like my income decreased significantly, but like I didn't, I, I put my daughter to bed every night and I was there every morning when she woke up and it was like, that is more wealth than I ever got from any paycheck. So it's, it's, it's very significant. You can't take away that quality yeah. of life, man. You cannot really quantify it um, in dollars and cents, you know, uh, but it is powerful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. So let's let's touch on Excited Capital one more time. Um, so you you said you didn't acquire anything in 2023, yeah. no new properties. Do you see any potential now with the market potentially picking back up? I don't know. There's a lot of talk about interest rates coming down. What's that going to look like for investors? Um, what do you see 24, 2024 looking like for Excite Capital? Um, 2024 is a once in a lifetime opportunity for people that are um, buying large apartment buildings. Um, so we are going to be, we're going to be very active this year. Um, why 2023, we did not close any deals. We spent the time building our investor base. We never slowed down, kept doing the work. And that has increased our investor base significantly, right? So we have a ton of investors now. So um, as deals start coming, we're going to be buying a lot of deals this year. So we do plan to be very, very active this year. And later on in the year, we're probably going to launch a fund to go over some distressed assets. Why I say 2024 is going to be a window of opportunity once in a lifetime is because um, in the last, uh, the last three years, there was a lot of activity in multifamily. When interest rates, the Fed dropped interest rates down to zero, Multifamily home uh, prices went up, like the large apartment buildings, the prices went up. And uh, a lot of operators bought deals using like short-term debt with like uh, floating interest rates. 
And all of these interest rates have floated way out of the, the level that the Fed was going to get. So you have a lot of distressed assets that are starting to come to market. These are assets where it was projected that debt cost is going to be maybe about 4%, but it's now at 8%. So you're talking about somebody that has a building and their, their mortgage has doubled, right? And you know how much that affects cash flow, right? So you have a lot of these assets that are starting to come to market where we're seeing prices that have been decreased by 20 to 30%. And some economists are actually projecting that those prices might drop another 5 to 10%. So you're going to see a lot of discounted assets that are coming into market in really good markets. I'm talking about these are assets with strong fundamentals that still have the, the, the ability to grow long term. And because of the bad debt situation they're sitting in, they got to get out. So um, we're looking to, to, to buy and keep educating as well. Um, yeah, so so, so we, we're excited for the future. So what type of debt do you use um, with Excite Capital when you're purchasing properties? Is it a mix of, of bank or and investors or is it straight, do you buy straight cash or what is that? Uh, like? I wish we had the money to buy straight <laughs> cash, man. <laughs> Not yet. Um, so we, we use uh, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac debt for the most part. Most of our assets are under like the fixed uh, rate debt provided by Fannie Mae. And uh, we actually have one asset that has a bank loan on it as well. Um, um, so, but most of our assets are done with, um, through the government agencies. Okay. And, and you're going direct directly, you're applying directly to the Fannie Mae. No, all, the, all they stuff. have like services, different services, all the banks, most of the banks are services for those, uh, lenders. Um, so it okay. just depends on which service you choose to get those, that debt. Okay. And if say I have some money and I want to invest it somewhere, um, are you, and are you taking all investors or is it just accredited how how can you help me out if i have some money in the past we've taken just accredited investors because uh according to the sec rule you cannot advertise your deal until you are uh, unless it's only accredited investors accepted so starting out because we needed that marketing we we're taking just accredited investors but in our next deals we have a ton of investors that are part of our network that are non-accredited that want to invest in our deals so we're going to do what is called a Reg CF, which is a blend of uh, accredited and non-accredited investor, starting it out, launching it as a deal that's open to non-accredited investor, then shut it down and open it to accredited investors. So non-accredited investors join our community because when we have a deal, the window of opportunity to uh, invest is very small. So you can invest at that point so you get to uh, take advantage of these great assets and grow your wealth as well. That's great. What type of returns do you give your investors? So we typically project uh, 14 to 20% average on our returns on our deals. Uh, but our last full cycle deal, uh, the investors walked away with 30% average on our returns. Wow. Yeah, I saw, I saw on your Instagram, you mentioned, uh, I think it was your, uh, I'm, a, I'm a real estate syndicator. Of course, I know what IRR is. <laughs> <laughs> what Can is that? that? <laughs> I, uh, I I cannot explain that. That's why I made that post because I <laughs> always, I, uh, it's one of the most complicated metrics that anybody they can they, they, I don't understand. I don't. I cannot explain it to be honest with you. That's why I made that. Post. That's why you have a team, right? <laughs> exactly. No, I I uh, is like it's called the uh, internal rate of return, and it's a very complex formula, right? That that you use to be able to get the IRR. Um, but essentially, is is just um. It, it determines like return over time, right? For example, the longer you hold an asset, the the lesser the IRR is. The shorter you hold an asset, the higher the IRR is. So it's a value that is commonly used by institutions. A lot of institutional investors lo use it a lot to be able to determine um, 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 how viable an investment is. You know, but the formula of calculating IRR or getting to it, that's what I, I cannot explain yeah. to you. But just understanding that concept is like t value of money over time, the return over time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've, I've, that's what chat, that's what chat GPT is for. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can try chat GPT and you're still going to be confused after you read it. <laughs> the formula is just like, so, so you True. guys, you mentioned um, before you brought, is it Dr. Oni? Yes, Dr. Oni. So before you brought Dr. Oni on, that you guys had struggled to raise a thousand dollars prior to that. So, yes. and now you're raising money for these huge syndications. Like, 
what what did you guys what changed and what I guess made you credible that you could go out and now raise this money? So Dr. Oni is a force of nature, right? He's somebody with a very, very great, <laughs> yeah, he's a very great orthopedic surgeon and um, very good reputation as well. And he has started doing a lot of investments on like startups and this stuff. He loves to teach when he's in the hospital, he's teaching other people about investments and all of that. So he has that credibility, right? And I'll give you an example. There were a ton of people in the hospital, like my CRA colleagues that I've been talking to them about investing in this. That I showed them that deal and they were like, ah, okay. And they did not invest in it, right? But when Dr. Oni came on board and they're like, oh my God, wait, Dr. Oni is partnering with Leslie? Oh, then what they're doing might make sense. You understand? So he brought in that credibility. Uh, and then he has a huge network, right, of other physicians that, uh, that he has known over the years. Um, so he reached out to a lot of his buddies and friends and they, they invested. So because he was on board, I had extra credibility, Tenny had extra credibility, and we were able to raise. And then, but the most important thing that happened is that we did what we said we were going to do. And we were very conservative, right? And we started educating people, making sure, stay, letting them know what they are, what's happening in their investment, like great customer service. So now somebody learns about it, then tell somebody else, then tell somebody else, then, then the network starts growing. And one of the most powerful things that we did after the first couple of days, there was like investing in marketing and personal branding, right? It doesn't matter how good of a service or whatever you have. If people do not know about it, it doesn't exist. That was a very hard pill to swallow, a very hard lesson to learn. I'm an introvert. All this stuff you see me doing on social media, I'm doing it because I have to market my business. If I had to do it all over, I'll be sitting back somewhere and not doing all of this. But this branding stuff is really, really, really powerful, especially in this, in this day of social media. So, so we invested in that and that significantly scaled our, our, our growth and our investor base. So talking about Dr. Oni, um, you, you know how they say when you go to prison, you find the biggest person and go knock yeah. them out. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's kind of where my mind went when you said, like, you brought Dr. Oni and then everybody knew that you were the real yeah. deal. <laughs> no, you, you, you were absolutely right. Like, one of the things I learned um, in, in um, when I was studying, as I was studying personal development is, like, find people that are more smarter than you and make friends with them, right? And that's, that's, that, that's been the secret yeah. to whatever growth and success that I've, I've had. It's about people, right? I'll give you an example. Like, Dr. Oni, I actually sought him out. I wanted to be his friend, and then we became partners. Another um, anesthesiologist, the very first day I worked with him, I was like, oh my God, this guy is incredibly smart, right? So we became friends. I started giving him value. We were exchanging books and then we became friends, realized that we have similar mindset. And now he's my partner with the infusion clinic and the value he brings, I can never bring it, you know? So, so that is absolutely true in life. Find the people that are better than you, connect to them and they're going to help you grow. You, you also mentioned having, uh, it, it sounds like you and uh, your first partner flipped roles in addition to bringing in Dr. Oni, who was the CEO. Yeah. Did you guys, how did you guys diagnose like what the problem was with where you were in the company and then, and then find your place? Uh, broker, broker, broker conversations were not happening because I was too scared to talk to brokers, you know, and then Tenny loves to talk like he could talk your head off. So we were like, uh, nah, this is somebody, he's more like a relationships expert, um, loves to talk to people, is more outgoing than I am. And um, uh, we did, we also did like a, like a this personality test, all three of us. So we're able to understand what everybody's strengths is at. And mine is more SC, which is more operations back end stuff. He is more outgoing uh, and more person, personal wise. So, so doing all of that, then we, uh, there's one book that we read, Traction. Mm -hmm. um that talked about having the right people in the right seat so we were able to look at it and like nah the way this is right now this is not the right seating Tenny needs to be here i'm here then dr oni is here and that just changed everything so uh, so you, you mentioned the influ infusion clinic that you partnered with a couple other people with um so what do you do in that and yeah how is that how are you what is it yeah <laughs> 
what is it? So the infusion clinic, we will administer um, um, ketamine um, infusions for uh, drug-resistant depression and chronic pain, and we also do vitamin infusions. So this came about, um, it's like my kids are, are like the influence of my life. When this came about when my son was born, I have a three-year-old son. When he was born, I was on paternity leave, and I was sitting at home one night, and I was uh, caring for him, and I'm like, man, Excite Capital is doing great. We're closing all these deals, but if you know anything about syndications, as an operator, you really do not make a significant amount of money until you exit out on the deal. Our deals are to be all three to five years. So I'm like, man, I got to wait three to five years before I exit out of the job and being able to take care of myself. Like, I'm going to miss out on this little guy's life again. So I was like, I got to figure something else out to generate income on the side um, that will be able to get me out of the hospital so that I could have time to spend on my kids and the uh, business. And so putting me to sleep, playing on my phone, I came across because I, I, I believe that I have this belief that whenever I need something, it comes to me. That's my belief, it, you know. So I, I take that seriously. So when I had that thought, I started playing on my phone. I came across a video of marketing on a ketamine academy. I bought the class right then and there, and I started taking it. And the next morning, I woke my wife up, and I said, we're starting a ketamine clinic. She was like, what, what are you talking about? You know, so <laughs> but, um, thankfully, and um, just started taking the steps towards doing that. And um, one of those steps was writing a business plan and doing all of that. So one day at work, I was reviewing the business plan and Dr. Joshi was passing by. We talk about business all the time. He owns a bunch of dental clinics, um, him and his wife. So when he saw that, he was like, Leslie, this is it. We got to do this together. I've been thinking about this as well. And I cannot think of a better person to do it with. Came back home, told my wife, and she was like, yep, let's do it. And, um, and we started working now. Just to give you some context, that was back in 2021. But the clinic did not open until November 2023, right? Hurdles, obstacles. Yeah. So because a lot of times we talk about the end, uh, but we don't talk about what happens in between that initial phase to, to get to that end. It's been one, uh, it's been a roller coaster ride for the past two years, but we stayed persistent and consistent. And then um, finally, at this point where we're seeing, starting to see the fruits of, of, the, of the hard work. Well, it's just like, it's just like everything. I think Alex Ramosi said um, entrepreneurship is so difficult because you're putting in a ton of work that you don't know for a fact that it'll ever pay you yeah. back. Um, whereas like a lot of people, they stick to their W-2 because it's guaranteed income. It's guaranteed. A lot of stuff is guaranteed. I mean, nothing's guaranteed. You could get fired, yep. but, but the mindset is different. Yep. So we're going to, we're going to jump to our final segment. It's, it's five questions that we ask everybody. First question is, um, what's a top financial resource that you go to, to educate yourself with top financial resource. Um, I, when it comes to finances, I, I do a lot on the real estate side. Um, the Lineman letters is, um, it's a letter on the economy by Peter Lineman. It's like a paid subscription. I read that, um, really deep dive into it because I love how he thinks about the economy and finances mm -hmm. and real estate. So um, that for me, that's my top financial resource. It's interesting. Earlier, you mentioned uh, Robert Kiyosaki, and immediately I thought you were going to say Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> but what, what, what was that book again? A Second Chance at Your Money and Your Life. Okay. So I actually read that before I went back to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I had never heard of Rich Dad, Poor Dad before. I heard of Second Chance. Then it exposed me to all of some of his other books. I did Cash Flow Quadrant as well. And then got the board game, and um, yeah, it really helped helped in my growth. Yeah, have you bought cows yet? <laughs> <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's always on some weird Not stuff. Yet. I know, I know. These days, he was like, uh, I try listening to his podcast. I'm like, nah, nah, nah. I think, I, yeah, <laughs> I gotta go back to the book. I, I, I yeah. like that image of a of a good uncle giving me good advice. Back then, so I don't want to lose that image of him. So I don't <laughs> listen to anything he says today. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's so uh, question number two is what, what advice would you give yourself as a new grad? Um, uh, think big, um, walk hard, don't settle. Right. Keep it simple. Um, yeah. I like that. And that's it. <laughs> All right. So you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but, um, we always ask everybody what, what this year looks like for you. What, what are your big goals and what are you trying to accomplish? 
It's just to uh, be the full-time entrepreneur that I've always dreamed to be and um, being able to give value to others. Um, one of the things we launched this year um, was like, at the end of last year, was like a mentorship program, trying to help uh, 20 other professionals buy their first um, large apartment buildings. So that will be something that I will be pouring uh, my energy behind to seeing others grow, something that I've always dreamed of doing, and um, um, I get to do it now. So that that will be my big goal for the year. Uh, number four, if you were to tell people to do one thing right now, uh, what would you tell them to do? Read a book. Not a book <laughs> on whatever career that you're in. Read a book on personal development or, or finances. Uh, so read, read a book. Yeah. Do you have a favorite personal development or entrepreneurship book that you would um, recommend? Killing Sacred Cows by our, our, our Guy Gunderson is a good one um, on finances. Um, personal development... It just really depends on what they ask me, but Think and Grow Rich is a good foundation for, for almost everybody uh, that I could recommend. But I also like another book. It's called um, The Code of the Extraordinary Mind by Vishen Lakhiani. And the reason I like this book, it, it talks about the power of beliefs, right? How your perception of the world is really um, shaped by what you believe in. And you have the power to change that by changing what you believe in. So, and I applied that in my life and it was a game changer for me. Did you ever read The Alchemist? Yes, I've read The Alchemist. I love oh, that book. See, you got to read it again, Josh. <laughs> I read it. When, when I say read, I don't read anything. It's yeah. audiobooks. So I, I read The Alchemist and I don't know. Some, it flew over your head, it, right? It was, it was over my you head, know, yeah. Some of these books, it depends on when you read it. Yeah. Right. Go back okay. to some of it, and then it was like, "Oh my God! Oh wow! Oh yeah, this makes it." There's some books that I read that I started reading uh, in the beginning of my journey, and I had to drop it off. Then two years later, I go back and I read it, and it has a totally different meaning. So that's a good All point. Right. Well, there you go. I'm gonna go read it again. Uh, but I was gonna say, "Think and Grow Rich." That that's one of the first uh, books on entrepreneurship that yeah. I read, and it's it's definitely got its own flair. It, it was written like 150 yeah. years ago, so there's a lot of a lot of that in there, but all of the concepts remain true to today. And it's, it's very so powerful. One, one of the most important thing I probably would have mentioned that for the advice is like, be very open-minded, right? Um, we come into life with our own beliefs or whatever world that we come in and we're being fed like the knowledge or the information that we have. And we use that to develop beliefs. And now when you start looking into a content, like think and grow rich or another book, you're like, oh my God, this is like some crazy stuff or whatever. But one of the things that helped me um, is that I was at a point in life where I was like, I don't care. I'm open to anything. I, I do tell me to go jump on a mountain or sing and chant and do whatever. I'll do it. I don't question. Right? There's a lot of crazy stuff, weird stuff that is all crazy. Maybe it works for some people, but that didn't work for me. But because I was able to do that, I figured out what worked for me. Right? If you are, if you want to grow, you got to be open to try things that you're not that that might sound crazy to you right now. So uh, I'm not saying go jump over a mountain and thinking that or go jump over a cliff <laughs> and thinking that you're gonna make money now. But stay safe, but be open minded to receiving information. Yeah. All right, number five. Our final question is: What's the biggest financial mistake that you made? And um, yeah, how do you avoid it? Now? Uh, uh, the biggest financial mistake I made was just I undergrad. I just took whatever student loans that they were giving me. Like it's free money. Hey, just take it, you know. So I <laughs> so I ended up getting out of undergrad uh, uh, with a ton of student loans, and um, I had to work um, hard to start paying that back up. And the other financial bad financial thing that I did is when I got out as a nurse, I thought I was a big shot. I went and bought a Mercedes S430 and I bought it used. And that car almost almost ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> so not Mercedes, it's it's get the No, uh, it was the like, Lamborghini. I just wanted <laughs> the, the, the name. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to fit in with the Joneses. I wanted to be a big guy, something that I, I was not. Um and I got it. I had a high interest loan on it because I could not qualify for it and the car started breaking down. So it cost me a lot of money to maintain a life that resonated within my life that I didn't care for, you know. So um, I was, and after that, when I got out of Sierra in this club, I went and bought a Toyota Camry, and that's the car I drove for nine years, and it never gave me any issues, right? So 
um it's it's not really it's not even about the car it's don't do anything in life to to please others right do what works for you and stick with it if you love that car you want to work out for it get it you know but i was doing it because i wanted to it was a lifestyle creep i wanted to fit in or be something that i was not and um that was a big mistake so what car do you drive today i, I drive a tesla model x with the, uh, with, the, uh, with, the yeah. with the with the doors with the <laughs> yeah the X wing yeah 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 how does that work in tight parking spots do they just go uh, straight it, it's, it's very sensitive it it goes like tight then it opens up at the top it's, it's a very intelligent car it's a car that I I've always wanted I wanted this car for like the last seven years so I've been working hard for it uh, slowly yeah. and then I, I was finally able to get it and you could play Candy Crush right there right. You, you could have bought this car probably when it first came out 10 years ago. Yeah, or I whatever. could have, but eight, eight years ago, but you waited until it was the right time. No, I was putting all my resources towards my businesses. Yeah. Like, um, my investment strategy is investing in myself, um, 80, 90%. So I was putting all my resources into my businesses and everything that, uh, we were building. And, um, when we got to a point where I feel like, okay, this is now there, then, okay. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. And then the other day, the great thing too is a tax write off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, is it is it more than 8,000 pounds or 6,000 pounds? It's more than 6,000 pounds. Yes. So it's a tax write off. Um, okay. It's a business expense. So um, oh, okay. that, that's one of the great things about having a business, especially a real estate business, is that there are so many tax advantages to it. So, yeah, I, I keep hearing all this stuff about these Teslas in the cold. Have you had any uh, trouble with anything out there? Um, they, they got to like 12 degrees last week. I didn't have any issues. Um, no, so. Good to know. <laughs> I haven't been in like negative degree temperatures and stuff, but it, it's a battery operated car, so stuff like that might happen. So, yeah. But, yeah, but it's, it's a really, really nice car. I love it. Yeah, that's cool. Well, great. This has been awesome. Um, I think uh, the only thing left to do is uh, just let everybody know where they can find you. Well, I am available on all social media as Leslie Awesome. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram or LinkedIn. I produce a lot of content on our Instagram and on LinkedIn. Now, my goal is really to share a significant amount of value and inspire others to think uh, bigger beyond the W2 as well. And um, you could also find more information about uh, our syndication company and our course on www.excite.com. That's x s i t e capital dot com. That's x s i t e c a p i t a l dot com. Nice. We'll have that in the show notes too, but I don't even think we need it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, good stuff. Well, thanks again for coming on. Oh uh, man, this has been an incredible, fun conversation, and uh, and thank you guys for what you guys are doing for the nursing community. Uh, educating other nurses uh, to to think bigger than um, than than whatever they are, or anybody that is looking to to step out there and do more stuff. So I really appreciate you guys having me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.